first saw him that morning in the lobby. He was, he was checking into the hotel and he was following the bellboy with his luggage. Welcome back to the special program devoted to a discussion of Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick's final film. And I am joined here today by four of my fellow Chicago film critics, Michael Wilmington of the Chicago Tribune, Jonathan Rosenbaum of the Chicago Reader, Ray Pride of New City, and Dan Geyer of the Chicago Daily Herald. And gentlemen, as I was watching Eyes Wide Shut, I realized how completely my attention was focused on this film. It's a long film, 159 minutes, but Kubrick makes it spellbinding right up until the end, which, however, resolves things a little bit too conventionally for my taste. Instead of sending the Cruz character on a sexual odyssey, which is kind of what we expected from the advanced rumors, it sends him on a voyeuristic journey. He visits, he sees, he talks, he witnesses, but somehow he never quite gets involved. Everything in the film, the saturated sideshow colors, the edgy music, the costumes, the ritual, it all adds up to a nightmare vision of a man whose jealousy takes him right up to the edge. I think this is a very good film. Michael, what do you think? Well, I would, uh, I'd be a little more extreme, I guess. I, I think it's one of Kubrick's best works. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I think that is because I looked at most of them to do a long piece on them. I'd rank it among his four or five, mm -hmm. and I, four or five best. Dan, what did you think about Eyes Wide Shut? It has something very, very important, I think, to say about intimacy and uh, honesty mm -hmm. in, in, in marriage or any relationship. I mean, you have Nicole Kidman, who's very open with her fantasies of what she thinks about sex and her needs. Mm -hmm. Tom Cruise is her husband. He's not only not being honest with her, he's in self-denial about his own mm -hmm. fantasies and needs. And so this creates the disequilibrium that sets the story in motion. So the rest of the movie is a very giant convoluted plot to get Cruise to the point where he can be back to equilibrium with his wife. I mean, that's the whole journey, this whole odyssey of the film. I have never seen anything quite like this. Mm -hmm. Still, on the same token, it's a Kubrick film, and it has all the Kubrick trappings. So it's kind of a maddening mix, r wonderful images, but uh, detached drama. You know, if you can get by that, I think it's a fine film. Mm -hmm. Jonathan? Well, I was both had a, the advantage and the disadvantage of having read Arthur Schnitzler's novella, Traum Nouvelle, before I saw the film, and was amazed at how close an adaptation it is. I'm really eager to see this film again because I had some trouble getting used to Tom Cruise in relation to this. He seems to be kind of a caricature. He seemed to be a thinner character than the others, whereas I thought Nicole Kidman and Sidney Pollack were both quite extraordinary. Ray Pry? I think that uh, Cruise's journey through nighttime New York is kind of an illustration of the very common question, what are you thinking? And he probably shouldn't have asked. Because the things that he's going to discover in these adventures are things he probably never imagined he would see. And in a way, because of its dreamy form, like he's always interrupted when he thinks he's about to discover something. It's like a dream. It's like, Cletus, interrupt us, interrupt us. Because of that dreamy form, it becomes kind of a, a, a masterpiece of sexual intimacy in the sense that people get so close to each other, but when you reach a certain distance, you don't get inside them, you get beyond them. And uh, it's infuriating in one's own dreams, but here it's pretty hypnotic. Well, the thing is, though, I thought Cruz was fine in the film, and I think he helps it to a degree because I think he is a figure whom the audience does kind of fixate on. He's, um, he's one well, of those movie stars. in a way, he's more powerful stars. than Kubrick. I mean, you know, when you, people are going to be going to see this film probably more often because of Tom Cruise and because but of... But that's not necessarily bad because, because Cruise did give, lend his power to it. And I think it's, it's used in... His movie star persona is used in a kind of interesting way. I was very surprised that I thought Cruise was a little bit more successful at... Not a little bit, that he was more successful as a Kubrick protagonist Protagonist than uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining, who's one of my very all-time favorite actors, yeah. but who I don't think leads you into the maze quite as effectively. Well, one, one of the things that works, because it's Tom, Tom Cruise, is that everyone in the film relates to him sexually. Even the drunks on the street who uh, try a little gay <laughs> yes. bashing. Every single character in this movie looks at him in a particular way. Okay, when we come back, Stanley Kubrick wanted to do two things. He wanted to make an adult film, and he wanted it to qualify for the R rating. That's how, how we worked, and it was uh, just intimate. You know, a lot of times you just felt like it was just me, Nick, and Stanley in those scenes. You ever pray with all your heart and soul just to want to walk away? Yeah. Leave it a bad, bad thing. 
bad, bad thing. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman with a little help from a Chris Isaac song and that scene from Eyes Wide Shut. And here joining me are four of my film critic colleagues from here in Chicago to discuss Kubrick's final film. And you know, when we heard about this film in preparation, we kept hearing it was going to be an adult film. It was going to be a really steamy film. And I think a lot of people expected it to get the NC-17 rating. Uh, but I was talking the other day to Terry Simmel, the chairman of Warner Brothers, who simply said, we're not in the business of NC-17 and that both he and Kubrick, he said, wanted an R rating for this film. And Jan Harlan, the executive producer of the film, and Tom Cruise both told me that Kubrick himself approved of the idea of using these digital figures who stand between us and the action, kind of the Austin Powers shot, where you can't quite see what's going on behind them. And as a result, we have these 65 seconds in the middle of the film that are not quite as Kubrick would have preferred in a different world. Well, what's infuriating, in a way, is that, you know, if there had been an axe murder in that, uh, in that scene, it would have gotten an R rating with the blessings oh, of sure, the MPAA. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, it just seems like such a, a strange sense of priorities. The galling thing about it is, Roger, that if you took the film that Kubrick originally envisioned without the digital stuff, mm -hmm. you could put it on late night HBO as is right now, and we can't get that version released in theaters around the country. But the real tragedy is these digital smudges are preventing us from having the same revelation as the character. He's been fantasizing about things that his wife may have done or that she might do with another man, and suddenly he's confronted with the fleshy reality of all these things. So movies like Happiness, for example, were released without a rating at all, and this movie could have been released uh, unrated, except Warner Brothers wasn't willing to do that. And so we get really a fairly minor change in the movie. And we still get the idea, but it just seems like it's galling. It's 65 seconds, not a big deal, but here's something else. It aesthetically doesn't work for me because you're in Cruz's yeah, eyes. Here is you're a guy going who this. is looking at stuff and he, you can't see what he's looking at and it seems wrong. It, there's something yeah. not right about you it. You get it's it like, intellectually, but it has no cinematic or emotional exactly. force, That's which is exactly what he's it. built through all the way up to the it's film a, for an hour and 20 minutes. Another problem, audience's it's an aesthetic flaw. It's, yeah. it's a flaw and it does not correspond with Cruz's natural curiosity to go around the implanted figures to see what's going on. Nor does it make the film more moral or I think more acceptable. It's. Um, you, oh, you, no. you can see what's kind of happening and, uh, and you know it's there. It's and, dirtier, and it's dirtier to have it half glimpsed because than you, to go ahead and see it. what you imagine is always worse it than what you actually a dream see. into an annoying nightmare. Okay, when we come back, oh, we'll all make... <laughs> when we come back, we'll all make our personal choices from among Kubrick's greatest films. Films are almost all available on film and disc, and I want to go around the table and ask you guys which one you would recommend and what people should look for, right? I would say the steady cam rushing through the corridors of the Haunted Hotel and The Shining. Dan. Roger, I was a teenager traumatized by the X-rated Clockwork Orange. Jonathan Rosenbaum. Well, I think I'd recommend uh, The Killing, specifically so cool. for That's all these cool. wonderful cool. noir actors. That car arrives about 5 o'clock. It parks directly in front of the main entrance to the clubhouse. Two men stay in it. One at the wheel, the other at a machine gun in the turret. Michael Wilmington. A must-see for movie lovers is the great visionary science fiction epic, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and that uh, wonderful way that he lyricizes technology in the Blue Danube docking scene. As for myself, I just looked at uh, Dr. Strangelove again last week. It's a comedy that holds up and still has its satiric edge after all these years. And the thing I liked best about it this time was George C. Scott's facial expressions in the war room. Now, it appears that the order called for the planes to uh, attack their targets inside Russia. When we come back, a look at Stanley Kubrick's favorite visual trademark. We're going to end with a montage of Stanley Kubrick's favorite visual close-up. Thanks very much, guys, for joining me today. I think it was a good discussion. We give it uh, five positive votes. Five people like the movie. All of us want to see it again before we write our review. Remember, you can hear this show and reviews of all the new movies on our website, siskel-ebert.com, part of the Go Network. And next week, I'll be back with reviews of more new summer movies, including The Haunting with Liam Neeson. 
That's next week, and until then, the balcony, if we had one, would be closed.